This episode is sponsored by The Bridge to Recovery, a nonprofit program on 115 acres near Bowling Green, Kentucky, a tranquil place where they've been changing lives for over 40 years. Their people improve their quality of life by acknowledging past emotional wounds and healing from all forms of trauma. The CEO, Paul Hamlin, has been a friend of mine for 20 years. Call him directly at 858 945 7848. That's 858 945 7848. Or you can learn more about the Bridge to Recovery by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting thebridgetorecovery.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I am Lucia Capriccioni, and this is The Path to Authenticity. I'm Tom Gentry. Thanks for listening to The Path to Authenticity. It is Friday, April 10th, 2020. And before the day's out, we'll probably have over half a million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States. So, as we're in the midst of all this social distancing, working from home, self-isolation. Um, I know I've had a hard time with it, and I think a lot of us are having a difficult time with this. You know, our lives have just been turned upside down with this thing. Um, and don't get me wrong, thank God I'm not sick, and no one I love is sick, but Nonetheless, it's definitely an issue of mental and emotional well-being. So that being said, I heard from Dr. Lucia Capicchioni last week, and she reached out asking if I wanted to do another episode relating to COVID-19 and the work that she's been doing with her clients in response to it. So of course, anytime I have an opportunity to have Lucia on the show, I'm going to seize it. So here we go. We had a great conversation together and it made for a pretty good episode, I think. So enjoy Dr. Lucia Capicchioni. Just the product of some bad seeds. Just some it's a pleasure, Tom. Great to be with you again. Well, it's definitely always a pleasure to have you. And, and you know, um, especially in a time like this, this is a, such a turbulent time. It's truly unprecedented. And, and I've been saying to people that growing up, I heard stories about the influenza epidemic and, of course, about the Great Depression. And I feel like that's all being revisited now several generations later. It's almost biblical. Uh, and I never thought I'd live to see that. And all happening at once. It's um, quite astounding. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I don't really... I always felt grateful that I had never gone through a time like that. You know, my dad grew up during the Depression, my mom and dad both, and... Um, you know, so I felt the effects of that passed down intergenerationally, but, you know, just the, it's, it's really has, uh, it's all very upsetting if we, well, it is. It and be. I've been saying to my students, because I've been teaching journaling since 1976, that. I feel as if my entire life has been a preparation for this moment in history, that all of the work I've done personally 
and all of the work I've done professionally has been uh, almost like a dress rehearsal for this moment in time. And I'm deeply grateful for two reasons, that I have this method to use for my own sanity right now and my own health, but also that I have it to share with others and especially families because a lot of families are really, really going through it right now uh, with children at home and uh, of so many parents being forced to do homeschooling even though the curriculum is being provided by the school. But structuring learning at home is another story. And a lot of parents right now are really beside themselves. They don't know how to handle this. So I'm grateful that I've developed uh, books for journaling for children, starting with uh, scribbling toddlers (laughs) Mm. and all the way up through the teen years and then, of course, adults and of all ages. So I just feel like all of the work I've done has been getting me ready for this. Wow. So talk about what you're doing with your creative journal work right now. Well, I um, started um, a YouTube series a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to be adding to that. Uh, And it's called, uh, it's on my YouTube channel, Lucia Capacchione, and that's L-U-C-I-A and then C-A-P-A-C-C-H-I-O-N-E. And on that channel, I'm uh, producing a series called The Creative Journal Goes Viral. And it's about using journaling at this particular time. And I'm starting with very basics like scribbling your feelings out with your non-dominant hand, which we can talk about a little bit later about the value of that particular technique. But the whole idea is um, for adults to use that hand to get into their inner child's deepest feelings and let them out on paper. Children don't need to scribble with their non-dominant hand because they're having a hard enough time using their dominant hand. Um, But in any event, the whole idea is to, uh, number one, is to feel the feelings and scribble them out, get them out of the body. Because if they don't get out of the body, they're going to uh, stay there and cause problems. And at this particular time, we cannot afford to compromise our health, our physical health, in any way whatsoever. So this is a very important health tool, as well as a psychological uh, method. It's really important for uh, keeping the immune system strong. And we can certainly talk more about uh, Penny Baker's research into the uh, power of writing about trauma and how it actually improves the immune system. Yeah. And you know, this whole COVID-19 thing, I think, you know, the, the lay person out there, um, wouldn't necessarily, um, associate this with trauma. So can you talk a little bit about how this is characterized as a traumatic experience or a traumatic atmosphere in which to be? Well, it's traumatic in many ways. Um, the insecurity about one's health is a basic trauma. So if one's health is compromised or in some way threatened, that's a really basic survival instinct to be sure that we are physically safe. And we're not physically safe right now. Mm -hmm. Um, If we feel that we're going to be exposed to something that is either going to lead to serious illness or death, uh, we're not going to feel secure and safe about our physical well-being. And that's something that we're all facing right now. Uh, Then, of course, there's the psychological aspect of what's happening with the economy. And that's why I said this is like the the uh, influenza of 1918 combined with the depression of 1929 and beyond right. because the the economic system is shutting down as well uh, and for a good reason because we need to shelter in place. And any state that's not doing that yet is um, simply deluding themselves and it's very tragic that all of the governors in the, the, all the states have not uh, mandated 
sheltering in place. So we we are noticing that the uh, uh, the contagion is being controlled to a certain extent in places where sheltering in place has been put in place. So. Um, but this is traumatic because we're dealing with our survival on a physical, very personal bodily level, but also on the economic level. And the economic ripples are huge. I mean, everything interacts with everything else. So, you know, even if I'm not personally threatened in this moment financially, uh, that doesn't mean I won't be down the line uh, mm. because other people's lack of um, ability to make money is going to impact me sooner or later. So, and then some people, are, I mean, they've lost their jobs. So it's an immediate trauma. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, unemployment, I can tell you from having witnessed my father losing his job when I was uh, probably around 10 years old, was traumatic for all of us. I mean, mm. that, I still remember him sitting at the table and telling my mother and I that he lost his job at MGM Studios. And I I still feel the punch in my stomach, and I was just a kid, you know. Yeah. Yeah, just very powerful trauma, yeah. So then for, you know, anyone who may not have listened to the other episodes we've done together, I mean, or just doesn't understand um, who you are, where you come from. I mean, I see you as the, I don't know, I guess I'd say the expert on the inner child and inner child work, definitely the foremost authority and the person who has developed what we understand as inner child work and, you know, inner child to me is basically a term that's at least to some degree interchangeable with authentic self. Right. Right. And I was actually the first one to my knowledge to put together a comprehensive program of inner child work to be used in therapy with in, in a series of sessions. And I wrote that material up in my book, recovery of your inner child. So there were a lot of people doing inner child work out there, uh, especially in the 90s. But I started this in 1976 in my private practice. And even though the concept of the inner family in um, transactional analysis had been written about and used in therapy, um, I had never found a comprehensive uh, week-by-week program that really installed what I call the inner family. It's, I really call my work inner family work. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that there were um, people out there doing inner child work who didn't understand child development, and I did. My second career was as a child development specialist. I was a Head Start director and uh, taught child development at Santa Monica College for years. And so what I noticed was people were discovering their inner child and possibly a self-nurturing inner parent, but they weren't really getting in touch with a protective parent, which I want to add is extremely important right now, psychologically and physically. And that protective parent energy is one of setting boundaries and limits and uh, being very non-emotional. Uh, and really being able to literally protect the inner child, which I define as our physical needs, our emotional needs, our creative, expressive needs, and our spiritual needs. And so that protective parent has to set the structure and the boundaries in order for the self-nurturing of the inner child to to happen in a healthy way. Hmm. And so... You know, now when, you know, we're talking about our basic human needs are being threatened continually. I mean, so this is all especially relevant right now. Absolutely. It's been, that's why I'm saying I really feel like everything I've done has been preparing me for this moment. To me, the protective parent within is um, the immune system of the psyche. Okay. 
the immune system protects us from uh, transgressions from the outer world, okay? So that the integrity of our inner system can be held intact. And what's happening with this virus is it's breaking through cell walls. It's attaching itself. And it's um, it's coming in from the outside. And um, when, in, in a psychological sense, when people come in from the outside and make demands on us that are contrary to what our inner child needs, that's very similar to what happens biologically with a virus that comes in from the outside and it, and attaches itself to us. So I always call the protective parent the antidote or the cure for codependence because the protective parent, which is a very non-emotional I call it the child's rights advocate, <laughs> the hmm. inner child's rights. It's a very non-emotional, it's like a really uh, effective attorney, hmm. you know. Um, it just wants to know the facts, and it, it doesn't get emotional. It doesn't um, uh, get, you know, soft and gooey and try to rescue other people when it's not appropriate to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, it It knows how to set boundaries and limits. And um, so for that reason, at this particular time, having a protective parent inside is extremely important. And it's the protective parent in us who uh, would put the sheltering in place mandate uh, into uh, place in our personal lives immediately. In fact, I was doing it before our governor announced it. I was watching the news about Washington State and what was going on in China. And I uh, read about the highly communicable nature of this disease, and I decided, um, okay, uh, I'm just going to be avoiding going out in public. And um, so I started doing that early on because I have a strong protective parent who Hmm. says, we need to protect ourselves from this. And this is what the scientists are saying, so I'm going to follow that advice. (laughs) Yeah. It's real simple. Yeah. And my, I I mean, I just feel so sad for people who haven't gotten this message yet, who are in some way deluded or confused or, you know, it's like there's nothing to be confused about here. This is a communicable disease and it can be controlled to a certain degree um, by staying out of uh, public places. And so anybody who didn't get that message to me, does uh, my interpretation is they don't have a strong protective parent in place. Mm. And without that, we are open to all kinds of danger from the outer world. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the work I do is helping people to see that uh, this is an internal, this is an inner job. It's an inside job. We need to understand psychologically what's called for at this time. And, of course, the uh, sheltering in place is making it possible for us now to go inside. In fact, it's forcing us to go inside and really pay attention to our emotions and to our body because we don't have as many distractions. We're not out running around on the street running errands and doing things and going to business meetings and all that other stuff. We're forced now to pay attention to our inner life if we choose to do that. I mean, some people can be distracting themselves now and uh, drinking, doing drugs, binging on television or, or food or whatever else their addiction is. They could do that. Um, but the other, the alternative, which is so much healthier, is to do some inner work now. We're we're home alone now, so to speak. Right. Even though we may be, you know, at, at home with the family, a lot of family issues are going to have to be addressed now that were not being addressed before. Because when you're cooped up with family members, you've got to deal with it. Yeah. And I'm hearing on television these um, some of these night. Time shows that are being, you know, telecast from people's homes now. If they're talking about what it's like to, you know, be cooped up with your family 24-7. Because most families don't do that. They're, you know, kids go to school and their parents go to work. And, 
you know, or whatever else they do, but they're not together 24-7. Yeah. And they are now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, and, and you mentioned addictive behaviors. I mean, um, my work has not slowed down um, as an addiction counselor. And, uh, you know, the, the admissions to addiction treatment facilities have not slowed down. If anything, they've, they've spiked a little bit, um, be, for the very reason you mentioned that families are kind of stuck together right now and right. they're witnessing dysfunction that they might not have seen before. Well, yes, and the, and one of the things that I'm very concerned about, um, I'm quite confident that we're going to see a lot of, um, after people come out of uh, sheltering in place, we're going to hear a, a lot and see a lot about um, domestic violence. Yeah. Um, which is going to inevitably, this is like a pressure cooker for any household where that's been a problem. And um, it's going to be a real issue that we're going to have to deal with. So, you know, that's just one issue. I mean, God knows what else is going to come out of this, but it is a pressure cooker. And uh, we're going to have to deal with what comes up. Yeah. Now, I do want to mention something about the value of writing about trauma and the research that was done, this is really important. I think you and I have discussed this before probably in our other interviews, but I think it needs to be restated again now. James Pennybaker, Dr. James Pennybaker, a psychologist, uh, years ago in the 80s at Southern Methodist University did some very important research. And this has kind of become the gold standard research for the issue of the value of writing therapeutically. Okay. Because my work involves art and drawing because I'm an art therapist, but I'm also a journal therapist. And so my work includes writing. Well, Penny Baker's work showed using pre and post blood tests with control groups that the group that wrote about trauma and problems and challenges showed in their blood tests that their immune system function was improved after writing about trauma. The other group involved in the research was asked to write about anything. So they were writing about trivia. Mm -hmm. So that was a very big distinction between the groups. The group that wrote about trivia showed no improvement in their pre- and post-blood tests. So their immune system function, as measured by blood tests, was, you know, that there was no improvement. The other thing that they observed over a period of time was the frequency of doctor's visits by the two groups. The group that wrote about trivia had as many or more doctor's visits during the period of time that they measured after the writing project. The group that wrote about trauma had fewer doctor's visits. Mm. All right. Now, this research has been replicated in other places and other universities, and the results have been the same. And I can tell you now anecdotally from years of observations that I've made working not only with clients and students, but getting feedback from readers, that people who have used my journal method of both drawing and writing about trauma and challenges have literally turned illnesses around mm. using my method. And, of course, that's how I got into this work. I had a life-threatening uh, condition that, was, that had no cure. It, it was a collagen disease, and it was an immune system condition. And I was able to turn it around without medication uh, by discovering this method of journaling. So I have a very personal experience with turning illness around and strengthening the immune system through this work. And I'm 82 now, and I'm still going strong. I did a full-on book tour last year. Um, I have never been busier this year with my private practice and my training programs. And podcasts and interviews. I mean, 
this is the third one I've done in a week. You know? hmm. Good for so, you. So um, I have, you know, energy to burn. And I know it's because I've been using this method consistently for all these years since I healed my illness in 1973. Hmm. So I'm really glad to share this with people at this time. So talk about your YouTube channel and what you're doing on that. Well, the series that I'm doing on YouTube is um, a series of simple journal activities, starting with scribbling your feelings out. And I actually show my journal pages, and I talk about these particular journal prompts so that people can actually do them from watching the show. And the second one in the series, I include some writing and a dialogue form that I use where the dominant hand asks questions and the non-dominant hand answers. So, for instance, you can actually have a dialogue with COVID-19. <laughs> I recommend drawing a picture of it first and then dialoguing with it. And the questions to ask are very simple. The first one is, what are you? And then whatever it is you're dialoguing with, whether it's your backache or your, um, you know, empty bank account <laughs> or whatever it is you're dealing with, you just ask it what it is and ask it to identify itself in words, writing with your non-dominant hand. That's the hand you don't normally write with. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, what are you? The second one is, how do you feel? And then the third question is, why? Why do you feel that way? What's causing this? And the fourth question is, what can I do to help you or to heal you? Okay. Hmm. And those four questions give us the diagnosis of what the real challenge is. They identify it and what's causing it. And then, of course, the fourth question asks about the solution. Mm -hmm. okay. What can I do to help you? And I had an interesting dialogue with coronavirus that's going to be appearing on my blog in another week, uh, the power of your other hand dot blogspot dot com. And in that dialogue, I dialogued with COVID-19 and it said that um, it needed boundaries set around it, that it was a natural phenomenon and its nature was to grow and uh, to replicate, to reproduce. And it represented all of the out-of-control elements in our society and that we needed to set boundaries and limits around them. Hmm. That's a huge undertaking. Think about it. It's not just the virus, but all of the out-of-control elements in our society, mm -hmm. that it was time that we had to stop and we had to set boundaries and limits around them. Well, wow, and you know, I what I have seen, at least to this point, as the silver lining to all of this is that, as we talked about a little bit ago, it's forcing us to take a good hard look at ourselves. Well, the the most powerful insight I got was waking up one morning, and I don't know whether this came to me in a dream or whether it just came to me in that twilight zone waking up. But I saw a giant image of Mother Earth, and she was saying, all right, all of you, go to your rooms. Yes. yes. And stay there and think about it. Yeah. And then she said, and don't come out until you're ready to play fair, respect one another, and stop the violence, period. Yeah. And man, that woke me up because <laughs> I heard the words. I saw the image of this giant Mother Earth image, I mean giant, telling us all to go to our rooms. And uh, it, it it has stayed with me. It's like, yep, you're right. We have to, this is time out for the whole human race. Yeah. And um, and look at the stories we're hearing about people are seeing the blue sky. There are swans in Venice, Italy, in the canals. Swans. I've been to Venice many times. Mm -hmm. And I have never seen anything close to a swan in the canals there. 
I was shocked when I saw that photograph. Hmm. You know, we're hearing about people hearing birds where they live for the first time. Wow. So all of this shutting down is showing us what we've been doing to the planet and what we've been doing to ourselves. And uh, it's a it's a day of reckoning. It's There's no question about it. And what better tool than having this kind of journaling to go inside and work on ourselves? Not that we're going to disregard the need of others, and I think it is fabulous what's going on in terms of all kinds of fundraising for children and people, you know, adults and children, families with no food and no jobs and no housing. I mean, you know, people are really being asked to open their hearts to others now, which is something we all must do. But at the same time that we're doing that, at the same time that I'm working with people on Skype and on the phone and doing interviews and newsletters and all that, I am working on myself. I am working in my journal. And I am working on my own sense of overwhelm and uh, and the the fears that come up and the grief that comes up about losing the way of life that we've had. We're all in grief right now. Hmm. We have to admit that. And if we don't admit that, if we go off into some addiction and distraction and we don't feel the feelings, believe me, the other fallout of this is going to be mass illness, not just Hmm the virus, but I'm talking about mass illness, huge amounts of people with psychosomatic illness. Mm. And it's not going to be just in our heads. It's going to be in our bodies. Why? Because the body is a closet. And if we don't deal with the feelings and we store them in the body, it makes us sick. Mm. And so those are the other offshoot illnesses that I worry about. You know, the virus is one thing, but illness caused by stress and anxiety, that's another whole ballgame. And we could be facing that as well. Yeah. And the grief, you know, I mean, this, uh, I have struggled. I mean, I, I don't know. It feels like I've been basically sheltered in place for a month now, mm-hmm. um, right around there. And, uh, you know, I had a I had a weekend of like depression where I indulged myself and kind of binged watched some TV and gave myself a few days and then kind of came back around. But um, you know, I've had a hard time connecting with myself through all this because it is scary and painful and and um, and really, just last night I started to begin to get a little more grounded. I mean, what I have been doing a good job of is eating right, sleeping right, you know, um, getting a little bit of exercise when I can and and taking relatively good care of my body. But um, in terms of my psyche, um, you know, a lot of times for me, uh, an event will take place that's sad that will help me tap into the bigger grief, you know, and yesterday, last night we lost John Prine. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I just, it gave me an opportunity, first of all, to get in touch with that. Right. Um, but you know, um, it's just so sad. You well, know. one of the things I'm urging people to do, and I did this in the most recent uh, YouTube posting that I put up last weekend, was to write out what they've lost in all of this and um, and then find out what we can do to help that inner child who is grieving the loss of um, the life that we had. And in my... Uh, YouTube presentation, I actually read from my journal. I did a picture that looked like a labyrinth. It started with a little um, kind of curly, cute square in the middle and then a bunch of squares out from that and another one around the edge. And it was really a picture of feeling cooped up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
and and shut in, you know. And I I asked with my dominant hand, "What are you?" And it said, "I'm the insides." <laughs> and it meant, and it said, "Your insides underlined your mm-hmm. your insides all cooked up." And that was all the grief that I was holding in. Mm-hmm. And then um, I asked it, "How did it feel?" And it it said it felt grounded, you know, like when we were kids. And it brought up all these memories of rainy days because it was raining that day, and and feeling like you had to stay shut up, shut shut down inside, you know, all cooped up. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, my inner child relates to my child from the past, and it was all coming back, all those feelings of restlessness and being, you know, feeling stir crazy inside. And so, I admitted all of that, which a lot of us are feeling. That's no big deal. But then I went even further, and I let the child inside talk about what it missed. And it said, you know, it missed doing things and going places like it did before. And she told me that, you know, she missed going out for lunch or dinner with friends and going to the gym for exercise every day. And simple things like being able to get a cup of coffee and sit down at a local coffee shop. Right. You know, those are those are the simple everyday things that we've lost. We can't do that right now. Mm. And going to local shops and visiting with the shopkeepers. And in the YouTube video, I actually read it. And you can hear my inner child's voice because that's who was really speaking. Mm. And uh, it was very cathartic to write all that down and to talk about going into town and it's a ghost town. There's nobody on the street. Mm-hmm. And um, finding a little ice cream store open, which was a real surprise, and buying an ice cream cone, but having to stand out on the street to eat it because mm-hmm. we couldn't stay inside, right? I mean, this these sound like very little simple things, but they're huge because it means that we can't run our lives the way we did before. And I, I felt the, the extreme loneliness of standing out there on this empty street that I'm used to. It's a, it's a tourist town. It's usually mm-hmm. very busy. Nobody on the street, not one person, and a couple of cars driving by. And it was so desolate. I it, it was just an amazing... And very sad experience to be standing there with this ice cream cone in my hand. And I, at the same time, it was bittersweet because I'm thinking, but, wow, I can get an ice cream cone. And this is amazing. And I, right. you know, I love ice cream. And my inner child loves ice cream. And it's like, in the midst of all this, there's still this one thing that I can still get and eat right here on this street. And it was just a real... Uh, exercise in opposites and contrasts, you know. Mm. And it was funny because one thing that came to me was, yeah, ice cream is a necessity right now. It's an essential business. I'm so glad they're open. And I yeah. went back in and I told the woman working there, I said, thank you so much for staying open. You know, I never would have done that before. I mean, I was just, I had to go back and thank her for providing this very special treat in the midst of all of this, um, you know, change that Mm -hmm. we're all going through. Well, and there are so many people who, I mean, the, the clerks at the grocery stores, I mean, you know, people are quite literally risking their lives. Oh yeah. Yeah. To go to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a grandson who is an ER physician in New York city. Mm. And I pray for him every day. I bet. Yeah. What's he, he saying a, about He was there this. on a grant, oh. and he never had a clue that this was going to happen. And because he's an ER physician and had to put in, he was doing grant research, had put in a certain amount of hours of ER work, and this hit. And uh, and he is was actually from, um, he's working at the SUNY, uh, State University of New York, uh, Stony Brook campus out on Long Island. That's where they have their home, he and his wife and child. And um, But they were in New York for a few months, and uh, this hit. So he's right on the front line. 
right on the front line. My other grandson had a friend who died of the virus, and he was a young man in his 30s. Yeah. That was a very early death, yeah, in, in the whole cycle of this virus. I was shocked to hear that. Yeah. So it's 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 hitting close to home. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely it is. Um yeah, it's it's definitely a scary time. I mean, you know, um it, the um the fear that comes with all the uncertainty of this. I mean, especially the first week or two when I started to shut it down and stay at home. I mean, I work from home anyway, but no outside appointments, no face to face appointments at all. I mean, but, um, you know, we can control what we do. That's right. But we can't control what other people do, you know, right. and, which makes something like this really, really scary. <laughs> You know, I mean, well, and you know, one of the things I'm realizing when I define the inner child as our physical sensations, our emotions, our need for creative expression, and our spirituality, one thing I'm finding beyond the self nurturing and self protection of the inner family is the need for creative expression right now and the need for spiritual experiencing right now are really critical. Mm -hmm. And so one of the beautiful gifts of the journaling work that I do is that it, A, gives us not only a voice for our body and our emotions, but a voice for our creativity. And so the drawing and the writing that comes out without any pressure to perform or make anything that looks good to anybody else is a key factor here. And one of the things that naturally comes out of it is this spiritual connection with one's higher power. And I am talking to a lot of clients and friends and graduates of my training right now who are telling me that they are really getting in touch with that higher power. They've been doing dialogues with it. And in my method, the higher power writes with the non-dominant hand. And so they're asking questions. They're asking for guidance. They're asking for consolation from this higher power. And they're getting answers in words in their journals. And sometimes they're getting beautiful pictures. Um, on my blog, um, last, the last entry a couple of weeks ago, one of our graduates did a beautiful piece with soul collage cards about COVID-19. And she did a card about the virus, but then she did a card about healing, all with uh, collage. It is just exquisite work. And I really recommend that people take a look at that at the power of your other hand dot blogspot dot com. And um, Claire Perkins from Arizona did that beautiful soul collage work. And uh, it's very moving and it's very healing work. So getting in touch with our higher power is to me one of the the real gifts of this whole experience, if we will receive the gift, if we'll really take it seriously. It could be a deep uh, spiritual transformation for all of us. Well, we need it, don't we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Uh... And, you know, the higher power can have any name. Some people are dialoguing with the Blessed Mother. Other people are dialoguing with, uh, uh, you know, inner spirit guides that have come to them with their own names or um, some other spiritual leader or teacher of theirs. It doesn't matter who or what it is, but getting in touch with that inner wisdom that we have access to through this non-dominant hand drawing and writing it can be extremely healing right now and provide us with a kind of inner strength. As you say, we have no control over what's outside, but we do have control over how we experience and how we handle internally what's going on around us. 
Mm. And that's all we can do. It's the best we can do. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, an event like this, it really, man, it just really throws us off track from how we generally operate. And, you know, we have to reorient ourselves and, um, you know, and, and ideally that true North is what you're talking about. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a process. So, so for someone who's in the thick of all the, well, all of us, but what, what is, uh, what are we talking about here? If someone wants to put this into practice now, what kind of time are they investing on a daily basis? What are they? Well, I'm, I'm seeing now that the people I'm working with, um, doing all my work and have for a number of years online and on the telephone. Um, and I'm even doing my follow-up training with my uh, trainees, even though they come for a live intensive once a year. Um, all that's on the phone and online now. Um, what I'm hearing is that they are devoting more time to journaling now. Um, in the beginning, they were hesitant. It's like, I don't even want to deal with this, you know, yeah. <laughs> let's just go do some more binge watching on TV or, you know, let's get on the internet, let's be on Facebook or whatever. But as time is going by and some people have been sheltering for a month or three weeks, I am finding that they are spending more time journaling now. And they have reported to me that they can't avoid it and that there really are no excuses for not doing it now. Mm -hmm. um, and they are finding that if they don't do it and when they don't do it each day, um, they start feeling really overwhelmed and disoriented and depressed. And they don't like those feelings. And because they have this tool for drawing the depression out, drawing the overwhelm out. And you'll see in my YouTube videos, I share my my scribbles of overwhelm. I just mm -hmm. put it out there. I want everybody to see it. I'm feeling overwhelmed just like everybody else. Part of my overwhelm is not so much the danger in my community, because I'm living in a county with pretty good statistics. You know, we're, we're rural, and we've taken this seriously, and we're we really have done a good job here. But my overwhelm is there are so many people in need. They're reaching out to me. And it's like there's only one of me, although I have 80-plus people that I've trained that are out in the world doing this. But just administering all of this outreach is, is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never been busier. And so I have to deal with that kind of overwhelm, you know. And I know I'm doing the right thing and I have the right tools, and I want to reach out. Um, but I'm adjusting to the amount of um, requests I'm getting and uh, the demands, you know. So I have to bring my protective parent in and make sure, as you said, I get enough sleep and enough exercise mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that sort of thing because I have to take care of my inner child. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm dealing with right now. Yeah. But I would tell people, that whatever you're feeling, if you just take it to your journal, draw it out first, and then write about it. If you only do that, that can go a long way toward allowing those feelings to get clearer and out of your body. Because if you don't do that, they're going to stay in your body, and they're going to cause headaches and backaches and stomach aches and all kinds of things. I had a, a person call me recently who ha was having a lot of the symptoms of COVID-19, mm. okay? She was experiencing shortness of breath and a headache, and um, she thought she had a fever, but when she used a thermometer, she didn't. Well, when she did the journaling, it turned out that those symptoms were psychological. She did a dialogue with her headache. She did a dialogue with her lungs, and they said... Well, you know, we're just anxious. <laughs> right. <laughs> the the headache was worried, and the and the lungs and the the heart area were anxious. Yeah. And so once she got the feelings out, she told me she felt 100 percent better. She called me back and said, "Wow, I mean, yeah, I I took my temperature. I don't have a fever, and 
and my breathing's okay now, and I don't have a headache anymore. Hmm. And I go, yeah, well, you d- you just dumped it out on paper. You don't need to carry it in your body. But it's real easy to to carry it in our body if we're not, A, feeling it, and B, expressing it in a safe way. Hmm. Well, Lucia, thanks again. This has been awesome. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. I, I got to tell you, I... I feel really lucky to have you in my life. Well, I feel the same way, Tom. You've been a good friend for a long time, and I'm so pleased that you're you followed your dream. Because I remember I was in New Jersey uh, <laughs> doing some work, and I remember the phone call. I can remember sitting at the desk in the guest room where I was saying, and you said, "You know, I have this this dream that I want to do this podcast and." You you talked about other things that you wanted to do, and I told you then, and I will tell you again, you have my complete support. So I'm part of your support system, and you are definitely part of mine. And that's what what we need to really remind everybody of right now. Is to That's the other journal exercise I strongly recommend, is do a diagram with yourself at the center, draw a big circle, and then spokes out from it. And on those spoke lines, write in all of your support system members. Who is your support system? Yeah. And really be clear about that. And where do you need help? And be able to ask for it. And where do you need to give help? Hmm. That's another important thing we need to do right now. It needs to be mutual. And that that is a lesson I think we're all going to learn from this, that we must work together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Lucia. Well, you are welcome, Tom. Keep up the great work. Thank you, you too. so much. All righty. Bye-bye. Take care. Be well. You and too. Stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>If you'd like to learn more about our guest, you can find links in the show notes or visit our website at thepathtoauthenticity.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or you know someone who would make a great guest, email the show at thepathtoauthenticity at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you know someone else who would enjoy the show or even just a particular episode, please share it with them. Every little bit helps. If you're not already a subscriber, please consider becoming one wherever it is you choose to listen. You can find the show on Patreon, where by becoming a patron, you can hear episodes before they're released publicly. You can gain access to supplemental content. There are other benefits in the various tiers visit patreon.com slash the path to authenticity. Join our Facebook community or follow the show on Instagram, both at the path to authenticity. We also have a YouTube channel. You can connect with us on Twitter or Pinterest to hear the songs from this and every episode. You can find the path to authenticity playlist on Spotify. Obviously there are a lot of ways you could be spending your time. So I appreciate you spending some of it here with me. I'm Tom Gentry. Thanks for listening. Be nice.
You did great, honey. The Path to Authenticity is powered by Equivox. For digital marketing and web design services, visit Equivox.com.